wonderful morning to come together and begin to worship the Lord this morning. Let's just lift our voices this morning and thank the Father God for His goodness. Lord, we are so thankful to You. We welcome You into our presence this morning, Father. There is no greater gift than for us to experience Your presence this morning. We honor You, Father. We worship You. Oh, we worship You. We worship You. We worship You. We praise You, Lord. We praise You. We praise You. We praise You, Lord. Oh, we magnify Your name. Glory to You, Lord. Oh, this is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I
Lord, we praise you. We count you faithful. You are not a man that you should lie. Everything that you say will come to pass. We believe you and we trust you. You are unchanging. Trust in you. 
examples of his faithfulness all over this audience. Glory to God all over there in Branson. I'm sure you got testimonies at your house on the internet. He's faithful. Glory to God. Oh, how many of you stand on his word? Amen. Glory to God. Isn't he amazing? Oh, so thankful. Glory to God. I don't even know how to express how thankful we should be. <laughs> Glory to God. Do that. Stand on His Word.
glory, glory. Isn't he amazing? I don't know about you, but if you need something in here, the anointing's here. Just reach out and take it. Get all you want. He supplies it all. Amen. Turn around, smile at somebody, and say, he's here. And then you may be seated. Good morning. How is everybody? Oh, it's so good to see you. Yes. Glad you're all here. You glad to be here? It's going to be a good, good morning. Good day. Yes. Well, I want to welcome any first-time visitors that we have. If you want to stand, we'd like to welcome you. Any? Hey, welcome. 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 So good to have you. Glad you made it. And we want to welcome any family or friends that are on the internet so you guys can wave and say hi. Say hi. All right, I have a couple announcements. Um, I want to let everybody know that the offices will be closed tomorrow, the church offices, in honor of Memorial Day. So yay, I hear shouts. <laughs> yay. <laughs> and um, we also had a Branson arrival so, Miss Holland Grace Herbert, five pounds, five ounces. <laughs> she was born Wednesday, May 22nd, to the parents of Isaiah and Catherine Herbert. So, we want to congratulate them, and I feel like she's one of my own. I've known Isaiah and Catherine since they were, and now they're having a little one. So, I'm so excited for them. So, if you're there in Branson, love on them and welcome her and them to new parenthood. <laughs> Um, and then, are there any birthdays or anniversaries? If you want to stand, we'd like to say congratulations. <laughs> Birthday. Oh, anniversary. Rob and Carrie. How many? 20? 20 years. Congratulations. Anniversary. 27. Congratulations. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Anniversary. 21. Wow. And we have a 43 back there. And happy birthday, Elizabeth. And let's look at Branson. Let's take a look. See. Oh, we can't see him. Oh, okay. Well, we'll believe God that those get up and working quickly. In Jesus' name, right? All right. He's a good God. He's going to take care of that. Yes. Okay. You guys ready for testimonies? Yeah. Okay. Um, this one comes from here. Um, since FLCS began, our family vacation home had been in Sarasota. However, during COVID, my parents decided to sell the house. Personally, I didn't feel to leave Sarasota and had been believing God for a place of my own for years. During COVID, the border had been closed for over a year and the desire of my heart for a pool house that would be for my use when I was in Florida had not yet manifested. As a Canadian, I could stay for up to six months each year. So when the border opened, I returned trusting the Lord to make a place for me. Through a series of events, the Lord had a non-Christian tennis coach and his 93-year-old Canadian father build me a tiny pool house on their property and it was fully furnished with all I needed. Praise God. For two seasons, this had been mine to use until this past winter they decided to sell. After greater faith, I began to look for a new location. And after looking for a while, I decided <laughs> to fully cast the care on the Lord. I asked the Lord to bring me a furnished place by the water for the rest of the season. And I stopped looking, but just thanked him for a place. One day, a friend of the landlord came by and asked if I had found anything yet. He then offered me his downtown condo on the waterfront for as long as I wanted, as he was going traveling for six months. The Lord is faithful to his promises. He is good and gives us the desire of our heart. Casting all the care on him, he did above and beyond what I would dare to ask or think. My vision has now stepped up even more, and I can't wait to see what God does next season. Praise the Lord. 
All right, this one comes from Georgia. It says, I have a cousin who had some challenges with her body, and I had that strong inner knowing to call her daily and share a scripture from your 101 list of healing scripture. We are starting over a third time. I can tell that there has been a change in her voice when I call. It is more full of life. She has gone from, I hope so, to yes, that's a promise. I let her choose if she wants to start going through the list again, and she has said yes. My knowing was that I was to let the power of the word do the changing. I am to not teach or explain, just let her hear a promise. Thank you for making this available. The word changes us. Uh, this one's from Texas. I would like to thank Brother Keith and all of you that are involved with More Life Ministries. Thank you for the broadcast and faith school. It shows people that we live by faith. All we have to do is ask the Heavenly Father according to his word and what we desire in the name of Jesus, and it's ours. Last year, I asked Father for a new truck, and last month, he gave me a new truck. Paid in full. He is so awesome. We honor him and please him if we live by faith. I pray blessings over you in the name of Jesus. And this one um, comes from someone from, in Branson. Of course, it's about children, so I thought I'd read it. Um, if you don't know, I help in children's. Um, it says, hello, Mrs. Moore. I know this is going to be a super long praise report, but promise that we'll enjoy it. So she says, I served in the children's department for several years, and it, it sometimes it's not easy on the flesh. And every other weekend to serve, <laughs> that's not supposed to be funny. <laughs> Every other weekend to serve, and countless times, Mrs. Patty would always remind us that we are sowing seed and for us to start claiming our harvest for that seed sown. Well, every time she would say that, I would think to myself, I'm an adult. How could I ever reap a harvest of sowing into children? So since I could never think of anything in the moment, I would just always ask the Lord to bring the harvest back to my own two daughters. So fast forward to the school year. This year, God has brought victory over victory to my two daughters. My first grader has gotten selected for many good behavior accolades throughout the school year. Also was on the top of one of the top two that was selected from her class to be pulled for a higher academic class. Then my fifth grader has been highly favored by our teachers and was the only student awarded with a sonic lunch and drink by her math teacher for reaching high academics in math. That's a big deal, sonic lunch. <laughs> and then she just recently took her end of her year assessment in reading and scored on an 11th grade reading level. She's in the fifth grade. She says, oh, God is so good. So as I'm sitting here just praising God and thanking him for his goodness to me and my children, he drops this into my spirit. You know how God can speak to you in just a matter of a split second? Well, that's exactly what happened. I was not thinking about church. I wasn't thinking about anything. I was just thanking him for his goodness. And within a split second, the Lord spoke to me and said, this is your harvest off of all the seeds sown into the children of Faith Life Church. And in that moment, I got it. I got it. I understood it. Serving has more meaning to me now because now I know what I'm serving for. Always before, I wondered how it would help me. Well, I'm a school teacher myself, and if my own children struggled, not only would I have to teach other students all day long, but then I would have to come home at night and teach my own kids. But I serve a mighty God, and even though it wasn't easy to show up and serve and give my time, God is faithful. And he sees every seed sown, and he will bring the harvest. Hallelujah. So go ahead and stand. Let's give God the glory for these wonderful testimonies, for his word working in people's lives and in our own. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for these testimonies. We thank you for these that have reached out and, and shared your goodness to us, Father. Lord, we're so thankful that we have this place, graces and abilities that we can serve, that you've given us the seed to sow. We give you all the glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Edward. Please have a seat. I won't take long. Good morning. Why y'all look so serious? I'm not going to make you do push-ups. I can't even do a push-up in this uniform right now. Can you tell? 
A lot of things disappear right here in the middle. Did you notice that? Look from the side. Boom. <laughs> All right, so you know what we're about to celebrate on Monday, right? What is that? Memorial Day, right? It's not hamburger and hot dog day. Even though many of us went to the supermarket and did our shopping already, right? But I want to bring it to your attention, the importance of this day is about to come up, right? Anybody know how many wars has the United States of America fought since the beginning? Since, uh, let's say, 1776. Anybody know how many wars? No, no idea, right? Twelve. Twelve wars. And that's without counting conflicts that we've been involved in during those wars. Right? We are very happy that we are in the United States of America. We are able to come to the church, praise the Lord, right? Go to work. Take care of our family. But that's only possible because God ordained people before us. To be part of the armed forces. So as we remember this, I want to give you some numbers. You ready? Yes. And the numbers that I'm going to give you, I want them to really become part of your memory. Part of your memory. That's why it's called Memo Memorial Day, right? Remembrance. A retained mental impression. That's the meaning of the word. A retained Mental impression. It needs to stay with you. So here we go. American Revolution, 1775 to 1783. 4,435 men and women died in combat. You ready for some more? War of 1812. You've probably seen it in the History Channel. Here are about all that stuff, right? That's 2,260. Die in combat. The Indian Wars, approximately 1817 to 1898, 1,000. Mexican War, 1,733. The Civil War, 140,414. Battle of Gettysburg, a lot of people remember that one, right? Almost 10,000 people died on that, on that soil that day. 5,000 from each side of the... There we go. Spanish-American War. 385. World War I. 53,402. This is combat. World War II. 291,557. The Korean War. 33,739. The Vietnam War, 47,434. Desert Shield, Desert Storm, 148. Uh, 604,000 people got deployed. Battle of Death, 148. American War, totals. Battle of Death, 651,031. All the death in theater, 308,000. All the death that are associated with that combat in service, 230,000. Are you getting those numbers? Okay. Global war on terror, still going on. That's what Memorial Day is about. Those men and women that gave their lives so we can enjoy this beautiful time that we have here right now. You understand that? That's what it's about. And there's a lot of family members. If you ever serve or you know anybody that was in the service, you probably know some people right now from the Vietnam War. They know a lot of people that probably die in combat. I personally know people that die in combat. So that's what Memorial Day is about. So when you see a military person, it's not so much thank you for your service. It's thank you for their service. Because I hope one day when I get to heaven, I get to say thank you to them in person. Because they gave me the opportunity to be able to serve in the United States of America. Okay? If you don't mind, get on your feet. Let's just pray for the family members.
And it's not supposed to be a sad day. We're still celebrating, right? But we need to remember what we're celebrating. What are we thankful for? That's why they put the flowers and stuff like that in the cemetery for all these men and women that are there. And I'm thankful. I'm so thankful that God gave me the opportunity to be able to serve. And also thankful that he gave me the opportunity to get to know him. Okay? So, Heavenly Father, we just give you thanks. Thanks for this opportunity that you gave us, Lord. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity to get together, Lord, only to thank you, praise you, and give you all the glory, Father, for all the good things that you have done for us, for our nation, and for all the good things that are about to happen for this nation, Lord. Because we know you have this nation in your hand. Thank you for the family members, every single military member that's out there, Father, in harm's way. Protect them, guide them, and show them your love through the entire time that they're in there, Father. And for the family members that have lost somebody in combat, Lord, give them peace. Give them peace today and let them know that you are with them and that they haven't lost them, that they are with you in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Glory to God. Stay standing with me just for a moment, if you would, please, before we honor the Lord with our tithes and offerings. You probably heard Mrs. Moore say the, the uh, screens are down in Branson. We're a tithing church. We have tithers' rights, and the Bible tells us that the devourer has been rebuked. So would you agree with me on that? So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, Satan, we bind your powers of darkness. Father, whatever is causing this problem, Father, with the screens, whether it's internal or external, Father, we rebuke the powers of darkness, Father, and we ask, Father, whoever is helping or assisting with this, give them wisdom from above, Father. Supernatural wisdom and insight, Father, in the name of Jesus. Now, screens, we call you restored fully restored and functional for the balance of this service and ongoing in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you agree with that? Yes. Glory to God. Well, go ahead and be seated. Thank you, Lord. Open your Bibles with me, if you would. We're going to honor the Lord with our offerings and our finances. Let's go to a familiar passage of Scripture in John chapter 6. This is the New King James Version. John chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Now, this is a, an account that you're familiar with about a boy who had five loaves of bread and two fish. Now look what he says. Jesus lifted up his eyes and seeing a great multitude. Now the multitude was 5,000 men. That doesn't count the women and children. So it's a great multitude. Multitude coming toward him and he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread that we may eat? Verse 6. But this he said to test him. Now notice. For he, Jesus, himself knew what he would do. Now, Philip didn't know how to answer that other than the fact, well, how are we going to feed all these people? Let's take a look at verse 8, 8 and 9. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? Now, at least he was thinking about something. Now, those five barley loaves, for us today, they're crackers. Those two small fish, they were pickled fish, sardines. So vision, a few crackers and a can of sardines. Now, this little boy, we don't know if he was little, it says a boy. He could have stopped this miracle. See, those crackers and those fish were his. He didn't have to give them up. Jesus asked for him, or one of the disciples did. Now, I think he knew of the compassion of Jesus, and that's the reason he was willing to do it. But, you know, if he had not given that, as far as Jesus is concerned, there would have been no condemnation on that little boy. Now, listen to this. What we can see from this crossroads is an account that each one of us will continue to be faced with in our life because we have a free will. When we have a prompting to give, when we have a prompting to step out and do something that he's asked us to do, how will we respond to that? This little boy made a decision that day. See, not only do we choose our destiny, but we also decide whether or not we will walk the road, now listen, 
of the extraordinary into the miraculous. See, Jesus already knew what he was going to do. Let me leave this thought with you. Think of the joy and the excitement that boy must have had when he walked through the crowd that day. He was watching people eat to their content, knowing my five little loaves and my two little fishes were instrumental in this miracle. Everything you and partners, people connected with this ministry, you have sown into this ministry. You have a part in everything that's being done. And we're seeing miracles taking place here. And you're going to see miracles in, this, in your life. But as you continue to walk out, be obedient to every prompting that he gives you. Amen. And it's going to be to God's glory. Amen. Glory to God. Well, the ushers are in the aisle if you need an offering envelope. We're not going to go over the projects or the outreaches today. Brother Moore can go over that when he gets back. Glory to God. If you're giving a check, make it out FLC. Credit card or offering or cash can go on the envelope. Forgive me by text. It's up on the screen. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Father. You're giving church. You know, we sowed into that 7X. Now, you know, Brother Moore, and this is how B and I received it, he called it finishing seed. B and I are standing for a finishing harvest. There's some things we need finished up that we hadn't received yet. It's coming. It's ours. Amen. Well, B, will you go ahead and come up here if you would, please? You can go ahead and stand with us if you would. Glory to God. Just go ahead and lift your hands if you would. Just say this to me. Father, I thank you, Father, for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to give into the kingdom. Father, I know as I give, as I'm purposed in my heart to give, that I can expect harvest. I can expect miracles. So, Father, I thank you that me and my family, we are the blessed of the Lord, and we are fulfilling your will and your purpose for this kingdom in Jesus' name. What's going on in the Faith Life family? We're getting our buildings, our lands, our houses, our vehicles, and our equipments. Next. All of our debts are being reduced and eliminated. And we're believing for extra coming in. Amen. And then next. God is bringing into our hands seed. Even some great big whopper chunk seed. And we'll sow it as he directs. Amen. Glory to God. Ushers, go ahead and serve the people.
Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's just start out by thanking the Lord because I just got a text about five seconds ago that screens are up in Branson. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are so, 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 so faithful. You are so good. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Lord for your goodness. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your love. Father, we present ourselves to you today as vessels that you can use. People that are useful to you, Father, to do whatever you choose, Father. We just ask you to give us utterance today, Father, words that would be useful to people throughout their days, Father. Bring them to our remembrance as we go to serve you each and every day of our lives, Father. Help to us when we need it. Encouragement to us when we need it, Father. Words that enlighten us from the inside. Encourage us from the inside. Put us over to the other side. I ask you for wisdom today for myself, Father that you would make my tongue as the pen of a ready writer to say only those things that would be helpful today, Father. Only those things that you would have me to say. Nothing of my own, but only the things that would be the most useful today. Our time is limited, Father. And we want to say those things that would bring people up to the next level that you would call them to, Father. We ask you for these things. And I ask you that every person in here would shut out the things of the day and shut out the things of tomorrow and hear what you would have for them that would help them to be the people that you've called them to be and help them to not be hurt and help them to not be offended, but be encouraged, Father, and restored and back on the path that you've asked them to be on, Father. We ask you for these things in your precious, precious name, Jesus. And everybody that agreed said, Amen. Amen. And you can be seated. Glory to God. Welcome, Branson. Yes, yes, yes. Glory to God. Well, Keith is in Mexico. Yes, yes, yes. He did a service yesterday, a graduation service. And uh, he said, those people are hungry. Hungry, hungry, hungry. And so uh, we could stir ourselves up some on that hunger. You know, if you don't ever get something, you know, what's your favorite food? All right, we're not starting out that way today now. All right, what's your favorite food? Uh, yeah, there you go. There, whatever it is. Yeah, that's your favorite food. What if you never got it? What if you were on some desert island and you never got it? Would you get hungry for it? You'd get very hungry for it. Well, if you never got the word and you'd never be able to talk to the Lord and you could never pray, you'd get hungry to be able to do it. You know, so uh, we should be able to do it on a regular basis so we don't get hungry for it. Glory to God, because I like to have certain foods a lot. <laughs> Tell by looking at me. Glory to God. So um, today um, I have a title that I think you'll like your own faith testimony. Mm. All right. You know, I get up here week after week after week and I read testimonies. And some of them are really, really good. Some of them are people healed of cancer. Some of them are people receiving their homes. Some of them are people receiving healing from stage four cancer. Some of them are people receiving healings of all sorts of things. Some of them are people receiving cars and, and having babies. We saw a baby today. And, but then you look across the crowd and you can just sense it. You can just sense that there's people, and I just felt it go, yeah. You can just feel it when you say that already. Well, that's not my testimony. I don't ever get to write a testimony like that. I hadn't got a new car. I'm still fighting this stuff in my body. 
I hadn't got a new house. I've been believing for a house for 45 years. Just the other day, we had Celebration Sunday, and I had a lady come up to me, and she had tears in her eyes, and she said, um, you know, I've been believing for a pair of diamond earrings, just little quarter carat diamond earrings for 45 years. And my husband said he wasn't going to buy them for me. I told him I, he didn't have to buy them. The Lord would give them to me. And just the other day, somebody gave me a pair. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And that's great. But you shouldn't have to believe for 45 years for something like that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. If we truly, truly, truly believe that the Lord is a good God and He wants us to have good things, what's the hold up on some of these things? Hmm. What, what's the hold up? Why, why are some people being held up on receiving some of the things that they're believing for? How many of you want to have your own good testimony? Yeah, yeah. Mr. Robert, can you stand up this morning? All right. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to be here this morning, but I looked across the way and I saw him standing here. How many of you know the testimony of Mr. Robert in here this morning? Oh, yes. Some of you do not know, but how long ago was it? January 27th. January 27th. He was at Daytona and got hit by a vehicle and they did not expect him to live right. at all. That's right. Yep. They did not expect him to live. We got the call and they did not expect him to live. Said he wouldn't walk. Said, told us all kind of lies. Lies, 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 lies. And uh, his body wasn't functioning, just all kind of stuff. And uh, he's here today walking, healed, getting stronger all the time. In his right mind. Yes, 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 yes. Because the Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful. And um, we can have more and more and more and more and more and more of these um, because the Lord is faithful. But you know, when I thought about this and I thought about what the Lord wanted me to talk about, I kept trying to go a bunch of different directions with it, you know, and, and, um, the Lord kept bringing me back to some things. And every time I'd try to get away from it, he'd bring me back to some things. And um, back to us, you know. And he said, how did you guys get the testimonies that you've got? You've, you've all heard the stories about the wonderful, you know, Marriott mobile home that we had. And, and the things that we have now. And... I'd like to say, again, I've said these things before, it's because we're so sweet and we're so good looking <laughs> and all these other things, but it's not. Now, I like gumbo. Now, I know everybody in here doesn't like gumbo. How many of you like gumbo? That's a big majority of the crowd, but I can just see Dave going. <laughs> but Dave likes soup. He likes, I, I make what I call a lunchroom soup. And he likes that. So how many of you like soup? We'll go, go that route with it. Yeah, okay. Like a good vegetable or soup, you know, something like that. You know, and I like to cook. And when you cook something like that, you have to mix several ingredients in it, don't you? Like for gumbo, you have to, of course, make a roux. And most people don't know how to do that. And you can put all the good ingredients, and, and gumbo can cost a good bit if you really make it right to make it. And it can take a lot of time to make. And that's why I talk about it, because it, it really takes a lot of time to make if you're doing it right. Happy Caldwell, how many of you know Brother Happy? Brother Happy called me the other day, and he said, uh, I'm so upset with myself. He said, uh, you know, you taught me how to make gumbo. And he said, uh, I made it good several times. And he said, but I had some neighbors across the street. And he said, they were from New Orleans and I was going to impress them with my gumbo. <laughs> That's your first mistake. <laughs> you were going to impress them. 
And uh, he said, so I made it. And he said, it was horrible. He said, it was just hard. He said, I tried to rush the roux and they came over here and I was so embarrassed when I served it to them. And uh, he said, you got to tell me how to do it again, you know. Well, you just write off. Of course, he rushed the roux. You can't rush the roux. You can't rush the roux. But anyway, back to the story. So you can make the roux. You can spend all the time making the roux. And you can spend all the time putting all the ingredients in it and get it just right. Just right. That are the soup. And just when you're ready to serve it, you can go outside and get you a big old soup ladle full of dirt and dump it in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> or as Brother Hagen used to say, get you just a teaspoon, just the tiniest little, not even a whole teaspoon. What's the smallest measure that they make? A pinch. Just a pinch of rat poison. Just a pinch of rat poison and put it in there. Now, how many of you want a good bowl of soup? Looks delicious. Or a big old bowl of gumbo with just a tiny, tiny, tiny pinch of rat poison in it. No? No? Brother Hagen used to say it this way. He said he's eaten a lot of good cornbread in his day, but he would not go out to the hog pit and pull out a piece of cornbread. When Keith and I started living for the Lord, we made some choices in our lives. And you heard me tell last week about Mom Hagen. How many of you remember that story? Only about a quarter of the crowd. Where was everybody else on Mother's Day? <laughs> okay, let's try it again. I told a story about Mom Hagen. I'm going to say jumped on me, but that wasn't the correct word. She loved me. Mom Hagen loving on me and correcting me the other day. How many of you heard that story? Yeah, that, that, so I won't tell it again. And she corrected me. What I did not tell, and I thought about it immediately afterward, was at that given time in our lives, Keith was not an employee. Keith was a volunteer. See how quiet it got? Now, had I have gotten upset with Mama Hagen that day, see, I tried to go away from this when I started getting my notes together. I tried to go a different direction with this. But I want to tell you how to get your own testimonies. Hallelujah. Really big, great big, huge testimonies. Amen. And how for your life to change. She corrected me. Now, I could have gotten really, really upset with her and pulled away instead of pulling in closer. And I would have never, ever, ever had the place with Mom and Dad Hagen that I had for 20-something years. There's not another person on this earth that was as close to them as I was. Everybody would tell you that. Not their kids. But that was a test for me. When Brother Hagen went to heaven, the kids came to me asking questions. 
Now, I don't usually tell these stories, but the Lord dealt with me about telling a few things today. I had a choice to make that day. When somebody corrected me or told me I was wrong or put me in my place in front of a whole auditorium full of people that could hear her doing it, I was not an employee, I was not a volunteer, I was nothing to her except for barely a church member. They barely had church on Sunday nights, Brother Hagen would speak. This was during a meeting, Keith was a student. I know I'm taking some time with this, but I want you to get the picture here. She made a beeline from where Carrie is to the other side of the auditorium. Amy, stand up over there in that corner in front of that plant, unwrapped there. She made a beeline to me over here to this side of the auditorium as quickly as she could. She was probably about my age then. I didn't know where she was going. I was kind of, and she pointed me out from where Jordan is sitting and said, and everybody could see her because, you know, if I was walking across the front of the auditorium, what would your eyes do? <laughs> Every person in the room would follow, where is Mom Hagen going? And they followed and she pointed and called me out here, what are you doing? Everybody was still in the auditorium. What are you doing? I said, I don't know. She's facing this way. I'm facing this way. So everybody could see my face. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what she was talking about. I said, I'm sorry. She said, what are you doing? She said, why aren't you in all the services every time the doors are open? And I, I stuttered. Because I thought I was supposed to be working, helping Keith, so that he could go to school, so that he could get everything he was supposed to get. And I was supposed to be doing that. But I wasn't supposed to be missing the services. You don't have to say amen. It's so anyway. It still makes it so anyway. Whether you agree with it or not, it was still so anyway. She said, Do you not know? There's a lot of pretty young women in this school. And you've got a handsome husband. And they wouldn't hesitate for one second to try to take your husband. And I just went, and everybody around could see my face. I suggest you get here. And my only response was, yes, ma'am, I'll be here. And she turned and she walked away. And that was the end of that conversation. The next time I saw her, she said, hey, come here. I said, oh, Lord. <laughs> What did I do now? She said, such and such is getting married. I want you to give them a shower at my house. I said, yes, ma'am. And it started. But what if I would have gotten offended? What if I wouldn't have been in church the next night? What if she wouldn't have looked across the crowd and seen me? What if I would have said, what right have you got to say that to me? Who am I to you? Who are you to me? But no. When we got saved, 
and we went to school, we meant what we said when we said, Jesus, Father, you are the Lord of our lives. Amen. 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 We meant that. And when he told us, did you get what I just said? When he told us, us. us yeah. to go to Tulsa mm. and for him to go to school, he meant for us to do this. He meant for us to do this. We were supposed to do this. Now, I wasn't in school, but we were going to school. And I was missing that. And I needed somebody to catch me before I went off the cliff. I needed somebody that the Lord put there that would love me enough to correct me. From that moment on, she became my spiritual mother. But I had to give her that place in my life. I had to say, you have this place in my life. Throughout the years, there was lots of times where we were corrected about stuff, where the Lord would show us stuff through different people, through the years, through Brother Copeland or Miss Gloria or Brother Hagen. Brother Hagen corrected me so many times. <laughs> I remember one time he wouldn't want it told because it, it was something else going on in his life. Had nothing to do with this. But I was there. And I was pressing his suits and everything, getting him ready for the service and stuff and, and taking care of everything for him. And I'd go in there and I'd take care of mom and I'd get her dressed for the service and, and then I'd get his clothes and I'd hang it out for him and I would get everything ready for him. And this one particular time, he couldn't find his cufflinks. And he's yelling at me from the other room. I can't find my cufflinks. I can't find my cufflinks. What did you do with my cufflinks? Where did you put my cufflinks? You should have just left them where they were. You should have. And just yelling at me, you know, because he was frustrated about something else. Later on, I found out what it was. He had good reason to fuss about the cufflinks. <laughs> have you ever taken something out on somebody else? What if I would have gotten upset over these things? Why am I telling you these things today? Why am I talking to you about these things? Because in your life, in every person's life in here, watching on the internet, in Branson, you should have people in your life. If I were to say, okay, let's just do it. Close your eyes. Every person in here, in Branson, on the internet, close your eyes. I'm going to count to five and you tell me who is your spiritual head within five seconds, who it is, who could correct you and you would not get mad. Five seconds. One, two, three, four, five. Would you? It's easy to say. Easy to say. That they could tell you anything and you would do what they said without question. That's few and far between. This has been so strong on my heart since Brother Jerry passed. You know, Brother Jerry had his own ministry. He was traveling how often? A lot. A lot. And Miss Gloria quit traveling, and what did Brother Jerry do? He turned, he readjusted, and he started going help Brother Kenneth. 
Now, if you know anything at all about helping somebody, you know that they're human. Rob's laughing over there because he's helped long enough to know that I'm human. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Brother Jerry helped Brother Kenneth long enough to know that he was human. But what got Brother Jerry to the point that he was in his ministry, in his life, and he could go before the Father God and, and, and the Father God tell him, well done. How many of you really want to stand before the Father and He look you in the face and say, well done? Well done. Brother Hagen used to say this, you want to know why I'm settled and established? He was like this. He, he didn't go up. He didn't go down. That occasion that I just told you about, that happened one time in the 40 years we was with him. One time. And if you knew what the occasion was, you might have been pulling somebody's hair out. And all he did was ask me where his cufflinks were. And by the way, they were in his shirt where he left them. <laughs> and he apologized. And mom said, there you go, accusing the cistern instead of the brother. <laughs> it became a joke between us. It was love, it was fun. Never got upset. I said, I'm sure I did something with him, Dad. And I found him right where he left him. How do you get your own testimony? Huge. How do you get maybe not a 7X airplane? How do you get the thing your heart desires the most? How do you get settled, established? Brother Hagen said, it was by the things that he suffered. Now he didn't suffer, he said, with sickness and disease. He suffered by putting his flesh under and not getting the things that he wanted. About a year ago, I wasn't going to bring this up, but I think I will. About a year ago, I started writing out some notes, and maybe someday I'll do it. I don't know. I thought about writing a book, which is not something I do, in the service of the prophet. I've had the privilege of serving four very closely. You say four? Yes. Jesus. Number one. Brother Hagen. Number two. Brother Copeland. Number three. Keith. Number four. And I've been as close to them as a lot of people have ever been. Now, how do you get that privilege? These are some of the most, name me more, in your life that you know of, prophets of God. How do you get there? What does it take? What was the word I just said? The title? Service. Service. Rob knows, Dan knows, Dave knows, our staff knows. When ministers come to town, we take it seriously. When I served with Brother Hagen, I took it seriously. I never one time 
not one time with Mom Hagen or Brother Hagen said, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. You want to know how to get God's best. I'm trying to explain this to you. We have some, come so far from the Bible and the way God sees things to the way the world does things that we've gotten so far off course to honor and respect that we've lost the things the way that God has planned for them to be. I never demand anybody say yes ma'am to me. Never do I turn around and say, oh, you should have said yes ma'am. It's not me that it's for. I never said yes ma'am for their sake. I said yes ma'am for my sake. Yes sir for my sake. Because I never wanted to forget to honor them and their place in my life, and remember the privilege that I had being there with them. Because the minute that you forget that, what happens? What happens the minute that you forget that? You lose it. The minute that you forget the privilege of being able to read the Word, the minute that you forget the privilege of being able to hear a good sermon, the minute that you forget the privilege of being able to go to church, the minute that you forget the privilege of having a good song leader, the minute that you forget the privilege of having good ushers, the minute that you forget the privilege of having good people that come and clean, the minute that you forget the privilege of being able to watch something on the internet or having screens in the church, The minute that we are unthankful and we forget the privilege of something, we can lose it. I don't want to forget the privilege of being able to serve Brother Kenneth. We've been doing it now for I don't know how many years, 22 years he's been coming to the church in Branson. And every time he comes, we treat it like he is, we treat him like he is royalty. Do we have to do that? A lot of you are not liking what I'm talking about today. But do you want better in your own life? Yes. Do you want the answers to why you haven't got the greatest heart's desire in your life. It's about the gumbo. You hadn't forgot that, have you? It's about the soup. Is soup soup with just a potato? Is gumbo gumbo with just a shrimp? You gotta have a mix of things in order for things to be something. You can't just go around and confess, I'm gonna have a baby for it to work. Mm. You can't just confess that I'm gonna get a new car for it to work. You can't just sew to get a new house. See, people don't like that. You've got to have all the ingredients working together in order to have a good pot of soup. Right. Amen. That's right. Amen. Now, I can make, he said it takes time, but it doesn't always take time to make a good pot of soup. It just matters if you've got the ingredients working right. 
But again, the world has gotten so far away from so many things of the world that we've got to begin to renew our minds to think right about the way things are supposed to be. You say, well, you've got to walk in love, but people don't even know what that means anymore. What does it mean to walk in love? It means that you don't always get your way. It means that you can't tell somebody off. See, people don't like that. They're looking at me like. <laughs> it means that you've got to give in. Amen. Walking in love means that you let somebody else win. Right, that's right. And no, look at the crowd. I wish you could see everybody's faces. Can you get a camera up here? <laughs> They put some rat poison in the soup. <laughs> if you want something from God, you've got to do it God's way. That's the part that people are missing. They beg God for something, but then they walk out the door and they go be mean to people. Mm -hmm. Or God says, I want you to do this. And they go all the way around the world to avoid doing what God said. Because they don't want to come in contact with that person. That would have been like when Mom Hagen told me to go to church, I would have quit going to church. I would have changed churches. And I would have expected and I would have confessed for the next 40 years. For my finances to be blessed. For my marriage to be blessed. For my home to be blessed. But I held a grudge against Mom Hagen for the next 40 years. If that's you, go back and apologize. She may be dead, but you better get it right. It doesn't work that way, guys. You put rat poison in your soup. And people are getting discouraged and they're getting depressed. The body of Christ as a whole has got 80% of its people depressed because they're saying the word doesn't work. It doesn't work. Why would I go to church if the Bible doesn't work? But the Bible works. Amen. Yes. It works. Yes. You just can't do it your way. Thank you. The Bible doesn't say if somebody slaps you, you slap them back. No, <laughs> what does it say? And let them slap you on the other one. And if, it, if they take your coat, what does it say? Give them another one. <laughs> But that's not what the world teaches. It says tit for tat. But what happens is, if you do tit for tat, you've got off on the devil's turf now. And you've left God. And you're doing it your way. And you've got rat poison in your soup. You're never going to get the blessings of the Lord. And you can quote scriptures, you can fast, you can pray, you can do whatever you want to do, but until, say that with me, until, until you make the corrections, make the correction. your body's going to be sick, your kids are going to be sick, your finances are going to be a mess, your marriage is going to be in turmoil. You can't go around what God's told you to do. That's right. And here's the horrible part about it. Oftentimes, God will use a person that you don't even like to tell you God's word, like me. <laughs> we like, we like. <laughs> The 
this is what it says. Proverbs 4.20. My son, attend to my words. Uh-oh. Incline your ear to what I say. Let it not depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart. For they... They are life to those that find them and then their health to all their flesh. Now these words don't always come through vessels that you like. I just have to be honest with you. Sometimes Keith tells me something and I don't want to hear it. Because he's my husband. And how many of you, your wives always like to hear it from your husband? How many of you wives tell your husband something and they don't like to hear it? <laughs> but it's still the truth anyway. <laughs> it's still the truth, whether it steps on our toes or not. If somebody really, really, really loves you, they're going to correct you. And if you never get any correction, nobody loves you. Because God is the best father in the whole wide world. And he said, what? He corrects those he what? He loves. So I was smart enough to realize that day when Mom Hagen corrected me in front of everybody, and embarrass me, and I was, now it wouldn't bother me at all. But then, I was very immature. I was a little Catholic girl that didn't know anything about the Word and didn't know anything about listening to anybody. I had a lot of growing to do. I was very embarrassed, and I was mad when I left. But I got a hold of myself, and I repented, and I took it, and I came to church. And it took me about, how long does Brother Hagin say it took him about? Y'all snap for me, come on. That long to get my heart right. Didn't take me a month, didn't take me a week, didn't take me six months. Took me about that long to correct it inside of me. And I didn't miss stuff. And mom became one of my closest buds. And she loved me and she corrected me all the time. But I needed correcting. But I knew she loved me. But it got me to where I am today. It got Keith and I to where we are today. And if you're not in a place that you're around people, that you have a place in somebody's life that they can correct you because they love you, you need to get someplace. Let somebody get their belt out after you (laughs) because they love you. And if you don't believe in it, I got some news for you. You need to read this black book that's on this table here. Because if God truly loves you and you want his very best, you're going to listen to his words. And all throughout the Bible, he was correcting them and showing them a better way to go. And if we want the very best that he has for us, he's going to be just about the time I would think I got it. I finally got it. You ever been there? You're going along and you're getting better at this and you're getting better at this and I quit doing this and I quit doing this. Then he says, now you can handle this. And I'm like, okay, God, come on. You ever been there? Oh yeah. But every time he does that, he's got something better for you. Never, ever, ever, Never, ever, ever, ever that I recall have I believed for a house or a car or anything. I'll remind you real quickly about the houses. When we moved to Branson, 
Well, Tulsa, before we moved to Branson, we were serving the Lord. We were going through everything that we were doing. Keith was in school. I was working. And we drove past this place. And it looked empty. I said, Keith, stop, stop, stop. He says, Phil, you sure you want to go up there? I said, what do you think? <laughs> he knows me. I jumped out. I went and looked through the windows. And I said, it's empty. There was no for sale sign. We went up. I said, we need to find out about it. Sky, where's Sky? Sky, his mom was a realtor. I've known Sky since he was knee high to a grasshopper. No, I've known Sky. He's, we've known each other forever. And uh, <coughs> I better get a drink of water here. I've known Sky for a long time. Anyway, so I called his mom. And I said, Miss Nancy, I said, I want to see this house. She said, I don't know anything about it. Let me do some checking. She found out, she found out it was a foreclosure, but it wasn't for sale. I said, let's make them an offer. She said, for real? It's not even on the, they're not doing it? I said, make them an offer. We made them an offer, and here's the bad part. They accepted it. Because <laughs> we made them a crazy offer. We didn't have the money. They accepted it. Where are we going to get the money? We didn't have it, but God had it. We went and we did one meeting on a Wednesday night. It was enough to cover what we needed. We got in the house. God did it. God did it. The next house, when we moved here, we lived in a little house on the golf course. Someday I'll show y'all pictures of it. I'll do a faith adventures again real soon. We were looking around because we were doing the church. I looked at one house because the Lord said, you'll have to get out of this house. It's a rental house. We only had the lease for so long. I went and looked at one house. I went in it for five minutes and I had my dad with me and he said, you have to get your dad to the doctor. So I went, I said, this is not for me. And I turned around and I walked out the door and the Lord says, you better go back. So I, took, I went back in and I did a complete look at the house real quickly. And then I forgot about it. The guy that owned the house called me. He said, did you like my house? I said, what's not to like? It was a huge house. It was very nice, you know? And uh, it was the closest thing to the church. It was before Branson had gotten built up, before it had any houses in it. It was the only subdivision with a gate. And uh, it was how far? A mile from the church? Yeah, maybe a mile, mile and a half from the church, something like that. And uh, he said, you like my house? I said, yeah, what's not to like? He said, uh, would you give me this fart? I said, oh, no, I wouldn't even give you half of that fart. He said, okay, and he hung up the phone. Well, a month later, he called me back. He said, you still like my house? I said, yeah, what's not to like? He said, well, would you give me this fart? I said, uh, no, I said, I wouldn't give you half of that fart. He said, okay, and he hung up the phone. A Couple of months later, he called me back. He said, would you give me this fart? I said, no, I said, I wouldn't give you half of that fart. So we hung up the phone. A few months later, he called me back, and he was down to half price. He said, you said you'd give me half. I said, no, I said I wouldn't give you half for <laughs> He said, okay, and he hung up the phone. He called me back, and he was below half the price. He said, well, would you give me this fart? And I said, yeah, I'll give you that fart. And he sold me his house. And it was way, 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 of course you can hear, way below the price. And uh, we bought it from him. And, uh, of course, we could sell it now for triple the price. So um, the Lord did it for us. He chased me down. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I was busy building the church there. Well, when we decided to get the house here, we were here. Dan, Rob, I, Dave were here redoing this building. And we'll show you some pictures of that. I've got some pictures of it I found the other day of what it was before. Would you like to see those? Yes. Yes. And um, we were busy doing this building. And we weren't thinking about houses or anything. And one day I just got tired of being in here. Well, the first time I got out, I went to the puppy store and because I was just tired of being in here and I wound up with two little dogs. And <laughs> <laughs> they're cute, but I wound up with them. And, and then the next day I went out and there's a house not far from here. And I was driving around and uh, I went in this house and uh, this lady and guy and, um, it was kind of the same deal. I said, no, I, I, I wouldn't do half 
you know, of what you guys are talking about for the house. You know, I said, even if it's real close to here, I, I, you know, we're focused on a church and we're not focused on a house. And so a year went by and we got an email to the church in Branson. And they said, you looked at our house about a year ago. Um, we'd like for you to come and look at it again. During that year span of time, she got saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. And uh, she said, would you come look at it again? And uh, I said, sure. And so I went and looked at it again. And uh, it's about a mile from here. Yeah, about the same as Branson. About the same as Branson. And because uh, the Lord knows, I don't, I don't like to spend a lot of time doing stuff that I don't need to do. So traveling is a waste of my time. So um, it's about a mile from here. And uh, so I went and looked at it. And she says, um, my husband is in finance and uh, we financed it through them. And it'd be an embarrassment if we lost it. And we'd like to, for you to have it at this price just so that we can pay off what we owe on it and get out from underneath it. And it was pennies on the dollar. Thank you, Jesus. And not only did she sell it to us for that price, it's a long story, but I'll give you the gist of it. She and her Bible study group went in, cleaned it spotless, put new mattresses on the bed, put new sheets on the bed, put groceries in the cabinets, put pots and pans on the counters, put sheets and everything, and uh, had it spotless, left every speck of furniture in the house, and um, called me and said, uh, you can move in whenever you're ready, before we close, after we close, whatever you want to do. And uh, it was a good thing because I wasn't leaving the house in Branson because I still needed it. And uh, so we moved in one day, and there we are. Thank you, Lord. Now, I only tell you those stories. They're not because of me. Right. It's because you can have your own faith testimony. You can have your own. But it doesn't come from wishing. And it doesn't come from hoping. And it doesn't come from getting in over your head or trying to prove to somebody else that you've got something more than you've got because you're a faith person. It comes from doing what God said do. Amen. Yes. The Word says that we are doers of the Word of God. You see the little kids celebration Sunday. What were they saying? I'm a doer. I'm a doer. I'm a doer of the word of God. Why do we have them saying that? Because it's only the doers that receive from God. It's not the Bible toters. It's not the ones that can quote a hundred thousand scriptures. It's not the ones that come to church every Sunday and hear sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon after sermon. It's the ones that do. Come back to Mom Hagen. I know people don't like this. But when she said... You have to be in every service. From that moment on, I became a doer. I was in every service. I wasn't in faith school. I mean, I wasn't in healing school and I wasn't in prayer school, but I was in every service that was in the evening services or services that Brother Hagen was having. I was in those. I became a doer of the word. Yes. Everything that the Lord told me, I was doing. I became a doer of everything he told me to do. Say a doer of the word. You know, the man that built his house upon the sand. We sang about it this morning. How many of you can quote that story? Kind of, you know the story about the man that built his house on the rock and the man that built his house on the sand? What happened to the man that built his house on the sand? It got washed away. Could he believe for anything? No, because his house got washed away. Do you know what the, the front of that story is? Let's look at it. 
just for a second. Just for a second. We sang about it this morning. They'll put it up on the screen. You don't have to get your Bible out. You know me. They'll put it up on the screen. Just listen to me. Matthew 7, 24. Wise and foolish builders. Verse 7, 24, NIV. Everyone, read that with me. Everyone who hears these words of mine. Okay, now put the King James up. Here's where Keith gets the other. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and what? Do it them. Doeth them. Do it them. It's like a wise man that built his house upon the rock. And it goes on to say, And the rains came, the streets rose, and the winds blew and beat the house. And it did not fall because his foundation was built on a rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the rock and the rains came and the streams rose and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell with a great crash. Don't raise your hand. I call them faith failures and Keith corrects me every time. Because he says, Phil, your faith cannot fail. There is no such thing as a true faith failure. It's impossible for your faith to fail. But people have decided that they have been believing for things. And some people have been believing for things for decades. Decades. Whether it be their healing, whether it be their marriage, whether it be their kids, whether it be their job, whether it be their ministry, whatever it is. And they've had fa failure after failure. They've not received it. And they've had failure in every area. Every area. They've not had any victories. Somebody please tell me why now. What didn't they do? What word? What word? What word? What word? My word was not a word directly from this book. Do you get my drift? Yes. My word was a person telling me something. Keith's word was, help Brother Hagen. Do you remember him saying that? Yes. How many of you remember Brother Keith saying, help Brother Hagen? Yes. What if helping Brother Hagen, we were so blessed. Brother Hagen was a dream come true. But you know what? Some of the people around Brother Hagen wasn't so dreamful. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. <laughs> some of the people that we were around, sometimes you just wanted to leave. You remember Keith saying, sometimes I'd put in for a request mm -hmm. to leave, and what would he say? Denied. 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 Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what did Keith do? He was a doer. doer of the word that the Lord gave him. The Lord gave him the word, help Brother Hagen. Now what if he would have left where the Lord told him to be, and then we would have tried to believe God for houses? Do you think these houses would have just fallen in our laps?
That wasn't everybody. Do you think these houses would have just fallen in our laps? No. Our flesh likes a lot of stuff, especially getting our way. Do you know I've been married to Mr. Submission and Authority now for almost 50 years? <laughs> And I know he's not watching because he's teaching himself right now. <laughs> and if I can do it, you can do it. Amen. And here's the thing about marriage. Everybody goes through tough spots. I've told about ours. But you got to stick it out. Right. Yeah. And you got to be doers. Did God tell me to go into the ministry with Keith? Did he tell me to quit the first time it got tough? No. no. Three people said no. He told me to be a doer. He told me to do the Word of God. He told us to go to Ramah. He told us to help Brother Hagen. He told us to go to Branson. He never told me to leave my husband. It's hard to get in faith for something when you've done something the Lord didn't tell you to do. Now there's repentance. And don't get me wrong, there's people that's already done it and it's, it's done. And God forgives. But as much as we can, we have to put this flesh under. Paul said, I keep my body under. Lest when I preach to other people, I myself should become a what? Castaway. Now, every time I go to an event like Celebration Sunday last week, everybody comes up to me and they think it's real funny. I don't think it's so funny. <laughs> they say, boy... You're hard when you preach. I have to pull my feet back up under me because you step on my toes. But you know what? Everybody that's ever been around me has helped me because they've kept me from getting in a ditch and messing up. That's right. Amen. Because they love me. Yes. And I would much rather have somebody look me in the eye and say, I don't do tit for tat. Straighten up, fellas. Thank you, Instead of letting me quit. Instead of letting me get off, instead of letting me mess up, right. I've got a wonderful husband. I've got two wonderful churches with, look at these beautiful faces in here. Some of them's a little sour right now, but other than that. <laughs> I'm just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Beautiful faces in here that love the Lord and want to do what He wants. Yes. They want to do what He wants. And it's so easy. I know the devil. I know how he is. And you'll be going along, going along, and all of a sudden he sets a trap for you and you stumble in it. And it's really hard to get out of there. It's like one of those things you see on TV and it's really hard to pull your way out of it once you get in it. But the Lord will help you to get out. He'll show you again what you need to do. He'll show you the way out. He said there's no place that you can't go that he won't make a way of escape. That's right. Amen. That's right. That's right. And that's who he is. Yes. No matter how far we've gotten off course, he will pull us back in and he'll show us a way that we can get right back on and we can be doers where we are today. And he'll get us right back on course and get us right back where we need to be so that he can give us all the blessings he has for us. And if you put a little rat poisoning in your soup, you remember in the Bible, they had some bad stuff in their soup too. He told them what to put in it right. Amen. to make it okay. Yep. Yes. And if that's the way yours has been, your life has been, your soup has been, your marriage has been, your kids have been, he'll show you what to put in it to make it okay. Amen. He'll show you how to get back on course. He is that good. Yes, he Amen. Is. No matter how bad we mess it up, He'll show us how to fix it. Because that's, right. that's, right. that's who He is. Amen. That's what He does. He's the master of fixes. Yes, yes. He'll just get right in there and He'll say, just take a little bay leaf, stick it in there, and it'll fix it. Mm. 
You understand what I'm saying? He'll show you what to do in your marriage, in your kids, in your job. He'll show you how to say, you know, I was, I was ugly with them, but I can go back and I can say, you know what? We were ugly about that. But you know what? We really didn't mean it. That We could have said it. You remember, you remember that letter? You remember Keith? And that person that told him he was wrong. How many of you remember that story? You know, she wrote him an ugly letter. This is how God fixes stuff. Let me just show you. She wrote him an ugly letter. And she said, you should not have said that on the platform. That was Brother Hagen's meeting. Well, what she didn't know is Brother Hagen asked him to say that. Keith didn't say Brother Hagen asked me to say this. He just did what Brother Hagen asked him to do. So, but she wrote him an ugly letter. And she said, you should not have said that. It was not your place. Well, it was his place. Brother Hagen told him to do it. Yes. So he kind of got upset about it. And he said, I'm not writing her back. I'm just going to go to Brother Hagen and I'm going to tell him what she said. And the Lord checked him. He said, if you do that, then it's going to cause a rift between her and them. And we're going to have a big rift over this thing. And the Lord said, don't you think you could have said it in a little more love? Don't you think you could have said it in a little more kindness? Don't you think you could have said it a different way? Don't you think you could have said it a little sweeter? Different tone of voice? He said, well, sure I could have. He said, well, would you do it for me? To keep peace, to keep your place, mm. so that you can minister to them later. Right. That I can use you to minister to them later. He said, well, that was the end of it for me. When the Lord asked you to do something, would you do it for him? Yeah. Right. Yeah. I got to writing, he said. He wrote her a letter. I kid you not, I was there. I was involved. She asked us to come to their church. Right. Wow. We went to their church. We got the biggest offering to date that we had ever had. We needed it. The biggest offering to date. It was a huge church. If I called it, you'd know it. It was a huge church. The Lord said, thank you. Handed us a huge offering. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Will he do that for you? Yes. If you're not too proud to apologize and fix what's going on in your life. Yes, 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 yes. Will he do it? Will he fix our mistakes. I've made so many mistakes. Oh my word. I've made so many. But you know what? I've learned. I'm not too proud to apologize. I'll come back and I'll say, you know what, Edward? I'm sorry. I should have said that differently. If I'd say something sharp to Rob, I'll come back. I'll call Rob. You know what? That was a little too short. I'm sorry. I should have said that nicer to you. Nobody's beyond apologies. The moment that you become beyond apologies, you got out beyond God. Okay? So let's all stand up. And let's all thank God. Thank you, Lord. (coughs) Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. For your mercy. Thank you, Lord, that we can all be greater doers of your word. Father, I just ask you. Say it with me. Father, I ask you. you To show me me anywhere anywhere that I have not been been a doer doer of what you've asked me to do. do. That I've got offended offended. or I've got off. off. Where any person... That's representing you you. has asked me me to do something. something. I will do it. it. And my house house will be built on a rock. rock. I'll get rid of of all the rat poison, all the dirt dirt in my soup. soup. And I'll do do exactly exactly what you've asked me to do. And I'll have the greatest of testimonies and bring you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe it, 
thank him for it. Thank you, 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 thank you. You guys got something you can sing? All right, Dan, you can close for us. I'm a doer, I'm a doer of the word of God. I'm a doer, I'm a doer of the word. Hallelujah. Bear with me. Because this really touches my heart. You know, she's corrected me. I work for myself. And you know, I told myself, the last thing I want to do is go to work for her. <laughs> and I'm working for her. Because <laughs> you know what I found when I was working for myself? I got to do it my way. When I work for her, I do it her way. <clears throat> but you know, I was brought up <sighs> that you do it the way you're told. And I rebelled against my father all kinds of times. And he just kept pressing. He kept pushing. And sometimes she's told me to do something, and I didn't do it. But you know, the bottom line is, when she tells me to do something, she's right, and I'm wrong 100% of the time. I don't care what it sounds like. I don't care if I'm like the fisherman. I've been doing this my whole life. She says, I want you and Rob to do it this way. And we look at each other and roll our eyes. And she'll, she'll check us on that. She'll say, don't roll your eyes at me. <laughs> but she's right. But when she gives you a word, like Brother Moore says, that word has empowerment. And when we do what she says, it works out like she told us. And it goes against a lot of times the way we've been taught or the way it should work. But God gets in there and he puts his hand on it and he does it. And I would encourage all of you to find that person like she was talking about, find your spiritual parents or, or find those people. Or, and like, here, we got team members, we got all kinds of things. And I'm sure I've said things that weren't real sweet and sugary. <clears throat> but like she said, she doesn't like to hear people say we all, she's always on. She's never been on my feet. If my feet get hurt when she steps on them, it's because I'm soft. I need to man up. I need, I'm in an army. And when you're in an army, you don't get it your way. You get it their way. You do it. And you salute. And like Dwayne Henry says, you execute. Hallelujah. But take this message to heart. And all those things she was talking about, they're coming to you. I looked for houses for 10 years in this town. I was in the wrong neighborhood. I was looking at the wrong houses. I wasn't looking at something God had to get involved in. I was only looking at something I could do. And when we step out and we start doing what, they're, what they tell us to do or what whoever is over you tells you to do, God will start moving. And no backbiting, none of that. And I've went to her and I've repented and I've told her, I, I've called her and apologized. Text, you don't owe me an apology. Well, that's gracious and kind of her, but I was wrong. I should not have ran my mouth. I shouldn't have had an attitude. I shouldn't have had a tone. And I'm not correcting you all. We love you. <laughs> and God loves you. And he's got great things for you. And those vision lists, he wants those to come to pass those situations or circumstances some doctor told you he wants that healing to manifest and come on he wants you to walk out of there he wants you to be a living testimony for him what the enemy meant for bad god will turn around for his glory and your good hallelujah well altar care workers will you come up to the front hallelujah and let's affirm or reaffirm our faith say this after me father god i believe in you I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross and he rose again on the third day. Jesus, as I serve you the rest of my days and you help me, everything will work out for my good and your glory. And I thank you, Lord, for shedding your blood for me to make that possible. There's a number on the screen. 
If you said that for the very first time or you came back, call that. There's altar care workers up here in the front. Um, if you have a testimony or something, come up here and talk to them about it. Or if you need a prayer or you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, do that as well. We love you. We appreciate you. Have a great day. Enjoy your weekend. Be kind and love on people. Have a great day. We're dismissed. Thank you.